Welcome to the Unconditionally Worthy Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Adia Gooden, a licensed clinical psychologist who believes deeply that you are worthy unconditionally. Hello, and welcome to episode 26 of the Unconditionally Worthy Podcast. I am so happy that you are listening. As always, today I am talking to my very good friend, Tobias Spears, and I am so excited to share this episode because there were so many wisdom bombs dropped. Tobias is a scholar, a queer scholar, a Black feminist scholar. He is an expert in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and he's in higher education and administrator. So he has a wealth of wisdom. And we really had a rich conversation that was very nuanced about our identities and intersectionality and how that all relates to self-worth and our self-worth journey. Tobias shared his own experience as a Black gay man and how he thinks about his intersecting identities, how that relates to him embracing his unconditional self-worth. And he shares some wisdom for you on your own self-worth journeys as you navigate various identities yourself. You are not going to want to miss this episode. Be sure to tune in and we would love to know what you think. You can connect with Tobias on LinkedIn. He shares that at the end of the episode and you can always leave a review give your feedback, and you can share your feedback with me on Instagram at Dr. Adia Gooden. So tune in, listen. I know that you're going to get so much out of this episode. Hello. I am so excited to have my good, good friend, Dr. Tobias Spears. I guess I, I, I think almost, but by the time this airs, you will have passed your dissertation defense. So I'm claiming it. And um, Tobias is a senior administrator with 17 years of professional experience. His roles have focused on diversity, inclusion, and justice with specific emphases on racial equity as well as queer and trans equity. He is a strategic thinker, a deft administrator, and Black feminist scholar. Tobias does public speaking, consulting, and capacity building with organizations interested in cultural responsiveness. As a scholar, Tobias studies race, gender, and sexuality across film, television, and other communicative cultures. For example, in his current research project, Tobias finds that representations of Black queer people in contemporary televisual media provide timely answers to longstanding sociopolitical questions about neoliberalism, coalition building, and future-oriented world making. Tobias' scholarship informs his professional praxis through the way he centers populations who are most vulnerable, ensures constituents feel heard and supported, and advocates for equitable deployments of material resources. I mean, I really don't have to say much else because my friend is fancy. And That's a lot, right? Really very intelligent. And it might be no surprise that he is a senior administrator at the University of Chicago because that bio... As all the words. Mm. Mm. So thank you so much for being here, Tobias. I'm so happy to have you on the podcast. Yes. Thank you for the invite. And I'm looking forward to a really robust conversation. Mm. I like that word robust. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm going to start us off as I'm starting off all of the episodes when I have a guest. And I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about your own self-worth journey. Mm. Yeah, and, and I think that's a fascinating question because I like the word journey, right? Because I think it, it's a verb. I think it is, it is something that is continual. It is something that um, is ongoing for me, right? Um, as a, as a, a Black gay man, right, growing up in Brooklyn, New York, um, with a family who wasn't necessarily... I mean, you know, it, it, there, there, were the, there were homophobic undertones to some things, right? But who wasn't necessarily antagonistic to my being, right? Mm -hmm. um, but even with that, it doesn't mean that I still don't like have those sort of implicit biases seep into me, right? Mm -hmm. and, and begin to sort of understand, you know, gay sexuality is wrong, right? But growing up in, in that space, right, I think um, my journey to self-worth or it continues to be one of like letting go of like pretense, mm. letting go of 
of, of, of a manufactured personality, right? Mm -hmm. A manufactured being. Um, and I think that that's because so much of my life has been about not being the wrong type of gay person, right? Mm -hmm. And in some ways, the wrong type of like black person, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I, you know, I didn't want to get HIV AIDS. And so therefore, you know, relationships were, is they, they could only be taken so far until I was in too much of a vulnerable state, right? I could never really like fully open up because I think I was always trying to be careful about not being the wrong kind of thing, mm. not being not being my parents' worst nightmare of a of of having a gay child, right? Mm. Um, and so my journey has been letting go of that, right? Mm. My journey has been embracing vulnerability, embracing making mistakes, and understanding that my mistakes are, um, you know, are, are not necessarily any more costly than someone whose being is more normative, right? Mm -hmm. That I don't have to hold myself up on a pedestal, right? While at the same time living in a world that's structured via homo antagonism and trans antagonism, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so it, it has been, my, my journey to self-worth has been about um, embracing a softness, right? Mm -hmm. um, thinking about my sexuality as, um, as, as something that I could be vulnerable around, um, thinking about my blackness in multitude, right? Mm -hmm. Not just a, a kind of hard, you have to be masculine kind of thing. Um, and I think that has been so impactful for me because it has allowed me to, um, to let my hair down, right? Figuratively, since I don't have any hair. Um, it's allowed me to let my hair down and just be. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is, that that is a journey to to a more like healthy self esteem, a more healthy self worth for me. I mean, what you said is just so powerful. It made me think mm -hmm. of so many things. It made me think about how so many of us construct our identities in reaction to mm -hmm. or reaction against yeah. stereotypes or assumptions about us. I think especially those of us who hold identities that are often marginalized, right? Yeah. Like, oh, I don't want to be this way. I don't want to be this stereotype. So then I'm going to be in reaction to it, right? right. And I'm going to mm -hmm. construct an identity that also then protects me, right? The pressure also of representation, the pressure of being the representative, being the yeah. exception, being the one who challenges the stereotype, all of these pressures that are so often put on us that we sort of think, okay, my worthiness is dependent on me living up to this or yes. disproving this stereotype. And I yes. love what you're saying about developing a softness, right? Allowing yourself to be, and I, and I sort of feel this sort of relaxing into yourself and this mm -hmm. idea of sort of self-creation. Who yes. are you at your core and how do you shine that outwards instead of, coming from the outside and thinking, okay, well, I shouldn't be this way. I shouldn't be that way. They expect me to be this way. And then that's how mm -hmm. I construct myself. Yeah. And how exhausting it is for a minoritized person, for someone like myself to sort of construct a life around all those parameters, mm. right? To, 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 you know, because, you know, and I, you know, it manifests in very interesting ways, right? Because I think, you know, my, my last relationship was with a Palestinian man, right? And the way in which, you know, I sort of understood my sexuality as being okay, so long as I'm partnered with someone Black, right? Mm -hmm. And how embracing someone who wasn't Black was also a kind of like, allowing a different type of self-worth, right? I'm, I'm a, it's okay. I, like, I, I can do this. I can be part of this, right? And so much of um, sort of how I was understanding my walk through the world, right, was being contoured by the stereotypes and the isms and the things I heard about who I should be and who I shouldn't be, right? And after a certain period, you just get tired, you just get tired of it. And sometimes you get tired and you can call it out. Sometimes people get tired of it and, you know, they wind up in bad places, um, you know. And so I'm just thankful to be around folks like you and like others in my life who um, I can talk about 
you know, this journey with, right? And having partners who I can talk about this journey with, because I think that also becomes important is to have a community of people who may also feel like their life has also been constructed for them, right? And, and not in a class sense, right, of like, we got to keep up this pretense to, to keep ourselves in a certain place, but like in a sense of, you know, it, in some ways, being the ones that made it, right, as Black folks, being the ones that, that did get the PhD, right, that did go, go into some field, and now like having the weight of all that on you, right, and continuing to try to be someone else to keep up with sort of where you are in your life instead of just like, I just want to live my life and be able to make mistakes and be able to cry and be able to call my parents and say, I did wrong, you know, all of that you want, right? And you you want them to embrace you um, just as they would, you know, um, you know, you you want them to embrace you not as a as a paragon of something, but as a person, right? As, as a person who is complex. Yeah. So. I mean, I think mm-hmm. there's so much there in what you said, right? The power of having spaces where we can deconstruct mm-hmm. these identities that we've crafted for ourselves or other people have created for us in reaction, spaces where we can be vulnerable, where we can kind of wrestle with these things, right? Yeah. Where we can wrestle with wow, I really sort of created this identity and that helped me succeed in academia Mm -hmm. or in this space. Do I want to keep that? Do I want to hold on to it? Do I want to challenge that? Or even the, I did all of these things to succeed or to be accepted and it still Mm -hmm. didn't work. Right. (laughs) Turns out these fools are still racist. Right. So maybe I'll let it go because it wasn't worth Mm -hmm. the energy or the effort, right? And just having spaces to talk about that and wrestle with the nuance of it is so amazing. Mm-hmm. And I, it is one of the things I love about our friendship. We have another friend, um, yeah. Darren, who you all also hear from on the podcast. Mm-hmm. And that is often where our, our conversations are centered and it's yeah. such a beautiful and freeing space mm-hmm to kind of have that place. And then, you know, I think the other thing you touched on is sort of wanting to be embraced. To me, that's the core of unconditional self-worth, right? Is really embracing yourself for all of who you are, right? We Mm -hmm. really long for other people to embrace us for all of us, right? Mistakes and all, quirks and all, strengths and all. And sometimes they do, right? And sometimes we have a couple of people in our lives who are like, I love all of you, right? I see all of you. I love all of you. And those relationships are so precious and important. And I think a big thing that I try to get people to do is do that for themselves. And it's not Mm -hmm. to replace the other people, but Mm -hmm. it's to create an internal space where you are fully embraced, where mistakes don't mean you're rejected, where mistakes don't mean all is lost and you're a failure, but where you show up for yourself day in and day out and say, you know what? Mm -hmm. I'm here. I'm sticking with you. Right. Yeah. It, you know, it doesn't really matter what you do. Not that I want you to go out and act a fool, but if you yeah. happen to one day, like, all right, we're going to figure this out. Yeah. I'm still here with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's such, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, when I think about the way that, um, like my own journey, even in therapy, right. The way that I'm learning that I can't control everything and that that's okay. Right. I'm realizing that that's a manifestation of me wanting to be able to say, well, it's a manifestation of me wanting people to always see me in a particular way, people to always experience me in a particular way. And guess what? I don't have control of that, Mm-mm. you know? And so, and, and, and it's, this is a self-worth um, endeavor because part of it is is part of this is me learning that no matter what people see of me, right, I'm still worthy. No matter what, no matter if they see me when I'm, you know, having a bad day, when I'm doing a good presentation or a bad presentation, or if someone, you know, doesn't like something, that that doesn't mean, right, that that's a hit on my worth. Yes. Right, right. And so, so much of my, me in therapy has been about like, letting go of, 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 of wanting to control the process 
and just letting life play out, right? And just having a firm rooting in who I am, right? And 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 what I want out of certain situations. Um, and, and that being the most important, right? Being able to articulate the things I want and the things I need. Um, and then letting people deal with that on their end. Yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? So, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Good. I mean, I, I love that. And I think that when we're in that space, that's when, like, we open up and truly shine, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's when we go full out and we share our gifts and we you know, affect change and we are able to do what we're meant to do here versus if we're like, what are they going to think? What are they going to think? They might not like, I I don't know. I shouldn't ask for that because they might think, you know, like all of this, like (gasps) edgy, right. And it's like, Hey, you know what? Here I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and it doesn't mean that you're like, I don't care what anybody thinks and I'm just going to roll over people's emotions and feelings. You still Mm -hmm. be thoughtful and considerate, but it means that you're not tiptoeing for the sake of you know, because you're scared that somebody might reject you for who you yes. are. Yes. And you get off the roller coaster of, of other people's expectations. Woo. So. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, you know, in your initial response about mm-hmm. your self-worth journey, I feel like you touched on a lot of pieces of your intersecting identities. Um, yeah. Right. Right. Being mm-hmm. a black man, being a gay man, growing up in mm-hmm. Brooklyn, how you felt yeah. about your sexuality, who you're dating or in a relationship with. And I'd love for you to share with our mm-hmm. listeners how you think about intersectionality, um, it, because I think it's so important. And I know you're you're an expert in this area. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's a really good question. And so, I mean, originally, right, intersectionality as a concept comes out of legal studies, right? And it's it was used by Kimberly Crenshaw mm-hmm. um, as a way for her to note um, the way the law was incapable of seeing Black women as both Black and women, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there was a, a, a lawsuit, a famous case, um, where a group of Black women were suing, I believe, General Motors or something like that. Um, and uh, they were, the, the, the court came down and said that they could not represent like Black men. They could only represent themselves as women, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, what Crenshaw was trying to show us was that the law was incapable of seeing black women of having like these two axes of identities that they need to contend with, which is I'm not just a woman, I'm also a black woman, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so intersectionality really begins, it, it, it surfaces in feminism and black feminism in particular as a way to think about this idea that identities don't just come together, but they actually come together and they mean something. Right. Mm-hmm. They mean a, a, a different type of um, of experience with the world. Right. And so, for, for instance, like myself as a, a, a black person. Right. Um, that that does not exist without myself also as a gay person, as a queer person. Mm-hmm. Right. Which that which also doesn't exist outside of myself as someone who was from a particular part of the country, right? Who's had a particular kind of education, right? And that all those things, when they work together, right? For some people, they could mean that, um, you know, that you are triply triply minoritized, right? Mm -hmm. That you have all these things working against you, not just race, but race and class and gender and geography, for instance. So intersectionality is basically a recognition that when your identities converge, they actually mean something and they, and they do something, right? And in a lot of ways, we see different parts of society that don't know what to do with people who have these converging identities, right? Mm-hmm. So you see, you'll see like gay neighborhoods, for example, that really play up sexuality, right? Mm-hmm. But there are people who are like, well, you know, I, 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 I'm glad that you're playing up my sexuality, but I don't feel safe as a black person in this neighborhood, or I don't feel safe as a trans person in this neighborhood, right? Mm-hmm. And so intersectionality really forces us to contend with those facets of identity that are really like not always in the mainstream, right? Mm-hmm. Or um, that are not always easy to grapple with, right? And that's why it's it's such a difficult um, 
thing to do. It's a skill, right? To understand that people have identities that mean something. And that means that we have to give them different types of opportunities, different types of services, right? Mm-hmm. Different types of recognitions because, you know, identities don't exist as like giant monoliths. Mm-hmm. And so um, I think this becomes really important because part of, you know, we, we talked about this in the beginning, right? Part of what sometimes happens for people who are minoritized, who do have all these converging identities, is that they exist in reaction to those, or they exist in a way where like, I'm going to try to undo all the stereotypes about myself, right? And so the more identities you have that are, that are, that are minoritized or that are ostracized or oppressed, the more you may try to act out in opposition to them. And rather than having like a a joyous and full life, your life is basically trying to not be all those things. And so you you may feel like that self-worth, you may feel like that self-esteem until you like get in a relationship and have to be vulnerable Mm -hmm. or until you have to like, you go to therapy and have to contend with maybe some trauma that you experienced. And then you realize that like, whoa, you know, I've been living in a particular way where I have not been being my authentic self, you know? Um, And something, you know, a friend said to me the other day, which I thought was really interesting because I was talking about, you know, being newly single, right? Uh, Having a dating life and dating people who, you know, who, who, as you date folks, right? You say, okay, I, I need to like this person, or I need to make sure I am, you know, uh, you know, being inclusive and and you sort of, as a person who believes in social justice, you sort of like put that all on your shoulders to do as a person who's dating, right? Mm -hmm. And you try to fix the world with your dating. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is, is that that's not really your job. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Your job isn't to like fix racism with dating. Your job isn't to fix the class system by by making sure you date people who, who like, who may have a low SES, right? Because then you're gonna be, you know, like, really like the bad liberal when you do stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. Your your job is to engage people around the things that you desire, that you want, right? And your job is to understand that, right? Those things may be organized around like, you know, implicit biases or like the things you've learned. Those things are all socially constructed, right? Mm -hmm. But you can't control who you're attracted to. You can't control, you know, the things that you desire, right? Mm -hmm. And so your dating life shouldn't be a social justice call or a social justice rally, right? Your dating life should be, you know, who you want to be with, who you desire. Um, But your, but your, your personal, your, your, your more political life should be about inclusion. Your more political life should be anti-racist, mm-hmm. right? And not that your dating shouldn't be that, but that doesn't, that, but you don't have to go into um, like, you know, a, a, a dating situation feeling like you need to carry every sort of social justice tenant on your back. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, I, I've been guilty of doing that. So. Yeah, no, I mean, I've been there too, right? Mm-hmm. Feeling like, yeah. Well, I should date this. What does it mean if I'm not attracted to this person, if they belong in this identity group? Right. And I think, you know, I think where we can be thoughtful and intentional is noticing if I'm only attracted to people who look like this or are like this, especially if that person, people fit into the mainstream, right? Right. Into proximity to whiteness or Mm -hmm. proximity to wealth or proximity, right? Like then we could sort of be thoughtful and say, well, now what is it about my attraction that it seems like I'm always attracted to people who look like this? Does that (laughs) reflect who's, you know, who's in Mm -hmm. the mainstream, right? Which doesn't mean performatively Mm -hmm. dating someone that you're like, I should be attracted and I'm not, but it means that you can get curious about how you may have internalized some of the stereotypes or mainstream right. mm-hmm. biases right. of your group, other group, right? Like, and, mm-hmm. and then be playing that out in, yeah. you know, your dating relationships. And so I, right. I think it is, it's tricky. It's, it's nuanced. I mean, I think one of the things, I don't know if this is a tangent or not, that like always kind of like 
irks me is when, Mm -hmm. you know, there are heterosexual black men who like down for the people that like, that's what they preach. Mm -hmm. And then they never, they're not with a black woman. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Interrogate that, like, right? It, Interrogate right? Like, that. Why can't you love us on yeah. a personal level and not just a political level, right? So I think there's some, which is not to say the person who they're with is bad or something, you mm-hmm. know, but it, it just makes me think this is interesting, right? This is yeah. interesting that you love people on a public sphere, but you can't on a personal sphere. So it's it's complicated. Yeah. And um, mm-hmm. you know, I think you you explain intersectionality and kind of like how we how do we think about these intersections for ourselves and for other people? Mm-hmm. Um, how do we understand that? You know, I think that there are some links between sort of understanding intersectional identities and intersectionality and how people navigate their own sense of self-worth. And I wonder if you have thoughts around those, those links. Yeah. Um, I was, I was, you know, part of what I think living in a minoritized body does to you. Right. And this, this is something I learned from Toni Morrison, which is that, um, Lots of times, things like, you know, homophobia and trans antagonism and racism, right? Those things keep you from being your authentic self. Those things keep you from doing the work, right? And so, you know, Toni Morrison said, you know, racism is a tool that sort of keeps us from doing the great work that we need to do Mm -hmm. because we're always like, you know, well, I need to contend with racism and blah, 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 right? And never sort of like, just like living, right? And being and existing Mm -hmm. Um, because we're always like in a perpetual fight against something. Um, And I think that, I think that- Dangerous distraction. Yes, yes. And I think that this is what minoritized folks have to do to, in in order to cultivate their their unconditional self-worth is to, to let go of all those things, right? That pull you in those other directions. Right. Because you will be a much better freedom fighter, a much better comrade, a much better ally when you have unconditional self-worth and when you can see yourself. Right. As um, as a being that's worthy. Right. You will do much better anti-racist work. And so I think part of it is we all we all have to take a journey where we contend with ourselves um, where we say, you know, what is my purpose? What do, what do I like? What, what, what am I getting out of activism, right? What are these things that, that make me smile, right? What, and, and, and these things should be, a, these things should be regardless of, you know, the, the, the homophobic and the, the racist impulses, right? The thing that makes you smile shouldn't just be, you know, oh, um, fighting a sexist, right? It should also be like, what are the things that you like to do? You like to come home and drink a glass of wine and and un, unwind each day, right? Those are also important. Or you, you know, you need to take a journey with yourself and go to therapy and and touch base with some of the traumas you may have experienced. Because so many of us have traumas that we don't know about until we go into therapy and we say, wow, that really did a number on me and I didn't even know about it, right? Mm-hmm. And so- that kind of stuff, I think, um, you know, racism, homophobia, all that, that keeps us from that. It keeps us from knowing our authentic mm-hmm. self because it forces us to always be in, in contention with those forces. Mm-hmm. And I think we have to stop being in contention with those forces and start figuring out what are the things that, that float me, right? Yeah. What's the thing that I love and I, and I can't get enough of. Um, and, and be selfish. You yes. Know? Be selfish with yourself. Um, and, 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 you know, so much of the, our, our world, right, is constructed around, like you talked about neoliberalism and because it's, it's part of my dissertation, but so much of our world is structured around us being in competition with each other, right? Us sort of seeing each other as like, I need to be better than you, right? And so in that capacity, right, I'm always looking at you as a barometer for myself. Mm. Right. And that is the thing I think that keeps us from unconditional self-worth because we are always measuring ourselves up to someone's to someone else's point in their life. Right. And I'm not you. I'm not where you are in your life. I'm me and I'm where I am in my life. Mm. And I think you have to really 
begin to ask yourself those questions and, and sit with yourself and, um, and begin to think about what are the things that make you happy? What are the things that sometimes make you sad? Um, and begin to know those things about yourself. Yeah, so. I mean, so much, I keep saying this, but so much <laughs> of what you said was so powerful. Um, you know, it, it makes me think about, you know, being very clear that the activism you do, the fight for justice, the, you know, striving to end racism is not about proving your worth. Mm, yeah. Right. That's yeah. not at stake. That's yeah. not in the fight. That's right. a given. Mm -hmm. Now, you may be advocating for people not to be persecuted, for all of these injustices not to happen, but to not let your worth and your sense of worthiness be caught up in this right. fight. Right. And right. two, I, I always say it's so important to depersonalize all of the isms, the racism, the sexism, the homophobia, mm -hmm. transfer, because there is actually like, so if somebody has a problem with me as a black woman, like that's their problem. Like I, yeah. there's nothing yeah. wrong with me being a black woman, right? Like, and I know that that means sometimes I have to deal with their issue because if I come into contact with it, it's frustrating, it's annoying, right? But it's not my problem. And it's not actually about me. It is about right. something that they have projected onto me mm -hmm. and I'm not going to take it, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm not going to own that projection. I'm going to let it hit me and then drop. Like, okay, yeah. I, I don't. So, and I, I know that's much easier said than done, but I do think that's a big part of, you know, owning your worthiness and knowing that that's not at stake. And I also love what you said about like, to me, it feels like having a life beyond the fight, mm -hmm. making sure that all of you isn't in the struggle yeah. and that there yeah. are parts of you that just love to play and have fun mm -hmm. and have mm -hmm. joy. I mean, I think black people are particularly good at this, right? right. Like we know how to celebrate. We know mm -hmm. how to sing and dance and eat and cook, right? Like there's a joyfulness that we can bring. And I think we also need to be intentional about it mm -hmm. so that we don't just get lost in the struggle so that everyone yeah. become about this fight, which is really yeah. exhausting. Yep. And, and in a world structured around oppression, structured around anti-Blackness, right? You taking time out to be okay with yourself, you taking time out to be more reflective about who you are and the things you like and don't like, that, that is an act of resistance. That is an act of activism, right? Because you are not supposed to, right? You are not supposed to be allowed the right of personhood, right? And so when you take that space for yourself, right, you are indeed, um, you know, still being part of a, of a larger activist mm. life. Right. Um, it's, it just has become individual. And, and that's so important. And it's so important to also take breaks. Right. Yes. Um, and to to not sort of like like you said, see your whole life wrapped up in something that's not personal. Right. Something that's not like intimately connected to you in some ways. Mm -hmm. Now, you may you may you may be part of activism because some, of something that happened to you. Right. But. Your, your existence isn't just about fighting, right? Mm. Your existence is also about rest and taking care of yourself and, and being okay with you and, and, and waking up one morning and saying, you know what? I'm just going to stay in the bed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your resistance is also that. Right. It's also that. So, yes. And I think that's, you know, particularly radical for mm -hmm. people who have been cast as the workhorses of our society oh, mm. yes right like for mm. the people who are like supposed to work and work and work and work and work and work with no rest right? right i did a workshop this morning and it was for a black resource employee resource group and i was talking about the importance of honoring your body because mm. our black bodies have been harmed, abused, worked to the bone, right? Like there is a, le a long legacy of that in the U.S., yeah. starting with slavery. Mm -hmm. And how radical is it to say, I am not going to treat myself as the world treats me. I am going to honor this Absolutely. black body of mine. Yes. I am going to care for this black body of mine. I am not going to work myself to exhaustion or illness, but I'm yeah. going to rest. 
right? And that is part of claiming and owning your worth. I'm worthy of rest. I'm not just worthy when I'm productive or producing or hustling or giving or, you know, I'm Mm -hmm. also worthy when I sit on the couch and I do nothing. Right, right. And I can can decide that I want to knit this sweater and I don't have to then create a whole, you know, Pinterest. <laughs> right. I don't, I don't have to, you know, I could, I could just write a rap song and just rap in my house. I don't have to get on, you know, SoundCloud and, and begin to, to sell. And like, this is my, I'm aspiring to be this. You can just be, you can just be your, your beautiful, talented self in your own little sphere of the world. And, uh, and that is enough, Right. Um, You don't have to turn everything into the hustle and bustle, which sometimes neoliberalism really asks us to do. You can resist that. So, so yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's another aspect of thinking about intersectionality that I'm um, Mm -hmm. wanting to connect to self-worth. And, you know, I think, you know, we talk about the, the challenges, the multiple sort of experiences with marginalization and oppression that can come from, um, identities, being a part of a group that's marginalized. I also think it's, it's useful to think about the magic Mm. that comes from owning these intersecting identities and the unique strengths, Mm -hmm. perspectives that someone has because they Mm -hmm. have this particular intersection of identity. Right. Right. And I think some of that is also about owning your way. Like you have a perspective Mm -hmm. that so many, you see things in a way, so many other people will not see things. You move through the world, you experience the world in a way you have a creative, right? Like all of this magic that I think comes from some of these experiences and identities. And I'd love to just kind of center our conversation around that for a moment. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, Patricia Hill Collins in Black Feminist Thought makes that, right, that argument, because Mm -hmm. part of what she's saying is that, like, Black women have this insight into, like, whiteness that demystifies it, right, because they are in the homes, right, Mm -hmm. the the way their identities have converged, right, and put them in this role as, like, caretaker in in these certain instances, they go into these homes and they realize that there's, there's nothing inherently better about being white than being Black, right? Because they get to see the intimate lives and details of, of white folks, right? Um, but I, I think you're right in the sense that, like, also, like, being a, a queer person who is also Black, who is also a man, right? I am allowed, um, I, I can embrace a different type of masculinity, right, mm-hmm. than, like, you know, straight men who are sometimes, you know, bound to this code of like always being on the prowl, right? Or, Mm -hmm. or, you know, straightness sometimes means that um, you can't like embrace the kind of hobbies you want to embrace, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, right, I remember growing up like jumping double dutch, right? I remember, you know, being fascinated by like, Barbie dolls, right? And and being able to like satisfy those curiosities simply because I was I was in these multiple groups, right? And um, they allowed for a type of flexibility, right? Now, of course, sometimes that flexibility is beat out of you, right? By homophobia, you know, whether it's yeah. psychically or if it's like actual materially, someone actually beating you, right? Um, but so much of like being a person who has these converging identities um, also allows you to enjoy things and see things that wear certain clothes, right? Mm -hmm. Like if I want to put on my skinny jeans, I'll put on my skinny jeans. And, you know, you, you may, you may have some perceptions, well, the world may see me this way, but you do it anyway, right? You can, you can like, um, embrace what it means to be, have close relationships with other men, right? Um, in ways that sometimes cis, straight, Black men don't, right? Um, mm-hmm. so, so yeah, I think, you know, having someone with intersecting identities in, in particular ways, you know, gives you a view of the world that um, others just don't have. And you get to be more comfortable. You get to be, you get to, um, 
to to not be affected as much by like compulsory heterosexuality, right? Which sort of prompts you to always behave in this way and do this thing. Mm -hmm. Don't say that. And you need to say this, right? You can sashay, you can chill and all these things that you perhaps couldn't do if your identities were different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I think it's, I just think it's so important to hold all of it together, right? The, yeah. hold the beauty and the pain, the opportunity and the challenge, the freedom mm-hmm. and the restriction, right? Because I think it's, that's what we're all sort of navigating through. It's not all one or the other. And you just yeah. articulated that so mm-hmm. well, you know, I was going to ask you how you felt that, you know, these isms, right? These, these things that marginalize us influence our sense of self-worth. And I think we've been talking about it throughout. I think you've shared um, a lot about this, but I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to kind of punctuate about how you think navigating, you know, a world that is not always welcoming and sometimes very harsh and harmful to us, um, antagonistic, yeah. how that influences our self-worth. Yeah, I, I think... Um... You know, so I think something interesting happened when we all went home because of COVID, mm-hmm. um, because I, I think we already had, of course, this revolution in like queer and trans communities with like Tumblr and like these digital spaces where we could find community, mm-hmm. right, even outside of the immediate places where we live, right, because the Internet allowed us to do that. Um, I think, though, that um, COVID sort of reinvigorated that, right? Mm-hmm. COVID sort of... Um, allowed us to look at and enjoy the viability of of networks of being connected to people, um, even when you're not necessarily near them, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that in in some ways, right, there are queer and trans folks, right? Other folks who are are minoritized, right? can now become parts of like online communities, right? Where they can find the things that they perhaps cannot find locally, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like, you know, black women talking together about yoga, right? Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, people who, you know, who have certain disabilities coming together online and and these different mediums, right? It's just so much of um, our communities right? Or so much about community can be found in digital spaces now. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also something to understand, right? Is that, um, we know, those people who live, who are living in places where, you know, you don't have the amenities of a city, right? You can use your computer to connect with people. And those people who live in a city who just don't feel like they connect with people in the city, Mm -hmm. you can use your, you can use a computer and the internet to connect with people who are in other places. And so, Going home because of COVID really like put back in the forefront this idea that we can use digital communities to really keep us mm-hmm. going. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's something that we should remember when we feel like, you know, the, 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 the communities we want aren't necessarily in our proximity. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, that really touches on something that I talk about related to embracing our self-worth is finding supportive people, right? Mm -hmm. Finding people who Mm -hmm. remind us that we are worthy and lovable and wonderful just as we are. And I think what you're describing is sometimes those people are in your physical space and Mm -hmm. sometimes you find those people online and you find a community where you say, oh, not the only one. There are other people like me, right? And that that does so much to be embraced and to see yourself reflected Mm -hmm. in a community and other people is a really... Um, important message, right? That you're yeah. ready just as you are. So I think that's great. You know, you've also talked about people sort of connecting to what they really love, doing mm-hmm. things just for fun, taking care of themselves. And I wonder sort of as we kind of wrap up this conversation, if there's anything else that you'd recommend to the listeners um, on their journeys to unconditional self-worth? Um, I, I think to... To, to, to understand that um, you, I think, you know, what I see a lot of is, um, and I mentioned this before, but I, I think what I see a lot of is people sort of um, measuring their journey or, or thinking about their journey specifically as something that has to be like 
juxtaposed against someone else's, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say that um, a, a, a change for me was when I stopped thinking that I had to always be compared to something else, right? Um, when I started to understand that my journey is my own, right? And that, you know, the best way to understand my journey is to think about where I was and where I'm going and where I am now, right? And that that doesn't always have to be about compa- comparing myself to another's journey yeah. or another thing. It, 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 is, it is simply about um, my own life, my own experiences. And a lot of times, right, people just don't see themselves as worthy to, to, to think about their experience as enough, mm. them being enough, right? And so I would encourage folks to think about how they have come from point A to point B, right? And, and what that means just for them, not for them as they compare themselves to other folks. Um, and to keep that central, keep that centered, right? Mm-hmm. That you are on a journey and that you the only person you should be measuring yourself up against is you. Yes, I love that. I love that. That is such a great space and place to end on. So as we wrap up, Tobias, I know that people are going to want to kind of (laughs) probably follow up with you. I mean, I think you, I said, as as I introduced you, that you do consultation, you do speaking, Mm -hmm. you obviously have an incredible amount of insight. So how can people or where can people connect with you? Yeah, I would say LinkedIn. LinkedIn, um, Tobias Spears. LinkedIn.com. Yeah. Make sure to follow up, see all the awesome things Tobias is doing. If you're looking for some, somebody to speak related to DEI topics, somebody to help with your organization. Uh, I think Tobias is excellent. Um, so thank you Mm -hmm. so much for being here, for sharing your wisdom and your insight. I think we did indeed have a robust conversation (laughs) and, you know, you just brought in so many things and so much richness in terms of thinking about this self-worth conversation from a different lens. And I really appreciate it. I know the listeners are going to get so much out of it. Cool. Thank you so much for the invite and yeah, follow up with me, Tobias Spears on LinkedIn. Awesome. 